989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989989
it can be easy to get frustrated by all the constant conflicting opinions and non-stop streams of advice. You want to talk about it, champ? No, but I do want to eat healthier and help our listeners learn the latest news about health and related subjects. I'm actually being serious. I, you know, I'm starting to really believe in some of the stuff we've talked about. Well, let's see if I can help sort things out. I think we've jumped ahead of ourselves a bit, and we ought to start from scratch and give our listeners a basic introduction to exactly what the Paleolithic diet really is, and why anyone would want to try it. Good idea. So the basic concept of the Paleo diet is that the human body isn't equipped to properly deal with many of the more recent additions to our eating habits. And by recent, I mean since the invention of agriculture 10 to 15,000 years ago. It might sound odd to characterize 10,000 years as recent, but we spent probably 90% of our history on Earth hunting and gathering, and that's about 2 million years. We're talking about avoiding many of the problematic new additions to our diet, such as grains, like wheat, rice, and corn, uh, or legumes, like soybeans and peanuts. Also dairy products, refined sugars, processed oils, like corn oil or peanut oil. And instead, according to the paleo diet, we should be eating meat, seafood, fresh fruits, vegetables, eggs, nuts, and if we need oils, it should be something like olive or flaxseed oil. Have I missed anything from the basic idea? Now we're getting somewhere. Uh, you've done a great job summing up the basics behind the Paleolithic diet. The proponents for this style of eating are concerned that 10,000 years has just not been enough time for the human body to adapt metabolically and physiologically in response to the major dietary changes introduced by the invention of both agriculture and animal domestication. Like you said, humans, in one form or another, have been surviving as hunter-gatherers for almost two million years, and it does seem reasonable to expect that our bodies would evolve and adapt as specifically as possible when exposed to a living environment for so long. So what can you tell us about the scientific research? Let's go step by step and start with eating grains. Are there digestive or other health concerns to be had? Now, we've already devoted an entire episode to gluten, so that's definitely a start, I'd say. Unfortunately for us, research specific to the effects, either short-term or long-term, of adopting a paleo diet is pretty sparse. There have been a few preliminary studies. A properly maintained, carefully observed paleolithic diet has shown some potential to decrease liver fat, help type 2 diabetics regulate blood sugar, um, improve cholesterol levels, and even lower blood pressure, all of which sounds pretty good. Most of the studies, unfortunately, had sample sizes of less than 20 people and lacked diversity, even considering these small groups of participants. Your approach to breaking things down into their component changes may very well be our best bet if we want to get a general idea of the possible benefits and risks of adopting a Paleolithic diet. Grains. I won't rehash the information from our gluten episode. I'm sure you've all listened to it already, right? But gluten isn't the only reason a decrease in grains can be both harmful and beneficial. Processed grains, for example, bleached flour, have been associated with an increased risk of obesity, diabetes, and other health concerns. Unprocessed grains, or whole grains, on the other hand, have been shown to do the exact opposite. The Paleolithic diet, when followed strictly, suggests reducing all grain intake which may or may not be beneficial dependent on the types and amounts of whole grain a person may have been eating. All right, next up are legumes. Such an odd word we so rarely use, and it just covers many different plants. With legumes, we're talking about alfalfa, peas, beans, lentils, soybeans, peanuts, and more. I think most folks who would say, I don't eat soy, have not been looking closely at the nutritional information labels of everything from cheese to pasta to breakfast cereal to hamburger meat. Soy is in virtually everything. I'm sure we could spend an entire episode on legumes, but are there any health concerns beyond the obvious peanut allergies? Also, how is a peanut not a nut? I mean, it's right there in the name. You are certainly right about soy. So many foods these days contain at least a measure of soybean, it's becoming worrisome. There are a number of health concerns regarding members of the legume family. It's been suggested that peanuts, beyond the well-known allergies some people have, may also cause systemic inflammation, which can lead to a host of symptoms and other conditions. Soy, which we just mentioned is in almost everything these days, actually has a chemical component that acts as an estrogen mimic, 
In other words, the receptors on your cell, which respond to estrogen, also react and can be blocked by a chemical component found in soy. In the past, soy has been found to have beneficial effects on the body, as well as harmful effects. It's believed that the phytoestrogens may play a vital role in both. As for the peanut being neither a pea nor a nut, I'll pass on commenting for now. The discussion always makes me feel verklempt. That's right, it's time for dairy products. We're not just talking about milk, but cream, butter, cheese, yogurt, custard, and ice cream. Like soy, milk shows up in a lot of products you would not imagine. Read your labels, people. Are there solid reasons to consider taking dairy out of our diets? Or is this just an issue for that very small handful of people with lactose intolerance? I mean, I think dairy is a great example of how agriculture has tried to change the human body. Milk is another one of those foods that still hasn't managed to be completely proven as healthy or unhealthy for regular human consumption. The nutritional content of milk, especially its concentration of calcium, has been shown to have beneficial results for weight management and maintaining bone structure. Many of the studies which have shown milk and milk derivatives to cause potential harm to the body have suffered from small sample size, just like those I described from the Paleolithic diet. Those studies have shown milk products as potentially inflammatory, with particularly negative results when testing low-fat or non-fat milks. Whether you accept that milk may not be extremely healthy for the human body in general, or if you don't accept it, lactose intolerance alone may be significant enough in its own right to steer people clear of excess dairy. Between 30 and 50 million Americans are lactose intolerant. As with gluten, sugar has already had its own 989 on health episode. Are we going to run out of topics soon? Are our listeners now too well informed? I guess that's just the price we'll have to pay. Maybe you can give us a quick refresher on the dangers of refined sugars. Refined sugars have recently been in the spotlight. Studies have concluded that eating too much added sugar in your diet is one of the most significant risk factors in the development of certain cardiac disorders, even more so than either fats or cholesterols. Add the increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes, higher blood pressure, worsening weight management, and the risk of obesity, and I would say that there is a very good reason to consider removing excess sugars from your diet. Now, the last paleo no-no to mention are processed oils, like canola oil, cottonseed oil, palm oil, and a bunch of other oils. So what's the problem here? Uh, I tried to read into it, but something complicated about free radicals and inflammation? I mean, why would olive oil be better for you? Oil's oil, right? Black gold, Texas tea. I'm afraid oil, good sir, is not just oil. The theory about the types of fats follows the same pattern as the theory regarding the Paleolithic diet. The body, developed as a hunter-gatherer system, has adapted and evolved over the years to make the most efficient use of the materials provided, which in this case means fats primarily sourced from meat products, and that means saturated fats. Monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats have been shown to cause systemic inflammation, which we know by now can cause a host of problems. The idea is that until the human body has been given adequate time to adjust and evolve, Consumption of fats in large or excessive amounts should be avoided, whether saturated, monounsaturated, or polyunsaturated. So we've covered the paleo don't eat this list. Now let's take a look at the yes please foods on the paleo list, and perhaps more importantly, the proportions of the portions. Oh, Mike. First up is lean grass-fed meat and seafood, which according to the paleo diet should make up 55% of your daily calories. So, if you're taking in 1,800 calories a day, that would be 990 calories for meat and seafood. Now, when you do the math, one ounce of lean beef has about 71 calories, so you'd need about 14 ounces of beef every day, a little less than a pound. Now, that might sound like a lot, but it is spread out over a full day. As an alternate, one ounce of tuna has around 52 calories, so you'd need about 20 ounces of tuna per day if that was the protein you were choosing for that day. Now, Brandon, can you first check my math? But my biggest question is, where can I buy this grass-fed seafood? The guy at Whole Foods just laughed in my face when I asked him. Your math looks pretty good to me. And I like your term grass-fed seafood more than I probably ought to. When trying to find quality fish, there are a few new terms you'll want to learn before you head off to the store. The first is wild-caught. Fish that is wild-caught is just what it sounds like. Caught in the wild, rather than being farm-raised. Why is that important? 
Farm-raised fish are often bred and raised in an environment far too small to support the numbers of fish being raised, and are also fed artificial foods and supplements to try to ensure that size, color, and supply meets industry demand. It might sound ideal, but more often than not lately, farm-raised fish are being found with higher and higher concentrations of toxic substances. That's not to say that even wild-caught fish is without its own risks. Wild-caught tuna in some areas are testing with high concentrations of mercury, an element you definitely don't want to eat too much of. With that in mind, I definitely want to caution our listeners against trying to eat 20 ounces of canned tuna per day, at least until test results start to show significant improvement. Let's say I'm all aboard this meat train and I'm looking for actual, factual, lean beef that was grass-fed. How much can I trust the labels on this sort of thing? I mean, are there laws regulating this? If I'm in the market for grass-fed beef, I don't want to buy a piece of cow that ate grass only one time at its eight-month weaning from its mother at a ceremony called, See, Mr. Federal Meat Inspector? I really am eating grass. And never again. I seem to recall in the documentary King Corn, cows were forced to gorge on corn for months on end and then spend a few weeks eating grass at the end just before going off to become food. The bakery where I work sends any bun that hits the floor to be used for cattle feed. And I know exactly what sort of random chemicals are in our buns. I don't want my food eating those chemicals. I know cattle feed is a huge, complex topic, but how much grass really is in grass-fed beef? That's a great question, and the best I can do is answer with not enough. There used to be a little bit more regulation in the meat industry, where the term grass-fed could be applied for through the USDA by small farming companies, and the term could only be used if the livestock had been raised entirely on grass, except for the milk provided just after their birth. In 2016, this standard was removed, and while there's still some inter-industry regulation, for the most part, companies can now use the terms grass-fed and grass-finished with a fair amount of leeway. For example, a cow can be considered grass-fed if they have eaten grass from a pasture at any point in their life cycle. Grass-finished just means that rather than using other, more expensive grains to complete the final stage before Bessie becomes a hamburger, they use grass. In both cases, the terms used seem to have a certain lack of trustworthiness to them. I have another silly question while we're still on meat. I do see that eggs are on the yes list, but I don't think there's such a thing as a grass-fed chicken. So is chicken not allowed on the paleo diet? And if they are, what are these chickens supposed to be eating? This is another big misunderstanding all too many people seem to have about chickens. Nowadays, when I look at the egg cartons, I'm seeing more and more labels that say things like grain-fed only or vegetarian eggs. Chickens are actually omnivorous. They are supposed to eat things like bugs, worms, and in nature, they'll rarely hesitate to eat meat if it's available. You'll also want to look for the term pasture-raised now. Generally, chickens that are pasture-raised spend the majority of their lives out in open fields, being allowed to eat the appropriate foods regularly. Pasture-raised chickens lay eggs that have a much healthier ratio of omega-3 fatty acids to omega-6 fatty acids, Legitimately, healthier eggs come from happier chickens. Now, one thing I did not see in my research into paleo was the idea of eating insects. I think a person would have to grow up their whole life eating bugs to see it as a normal or even palatable thing to do. But insects are high in protein as well as vitamins and minerals, and they could easily slot into the nutritional approach for paleo, especially those paleo enthusiasts who lean heavily on the we-should-eat-prehistoric-foods approach. Our prehistoric ancestors definitely ate a lot more bugs than we do. What do you think? You and I have definitely had this conversation before. In a world where cheap, easy-to-raise, easy-to-sustain protein sources can be hard for the average person to find and sustain, the idea of including bugs as a viable source is a good one. Things like crickets and mealworms take up very little habitat space, are reasonably easy to feed and nurture, and proliferate relatively quickly which all sound like good things to me. I don't want to go into the details and specifics of the potential nutritional value of adding bugs to our daily meals, but I do want to go on record as saying bugs as part of paleo sounds like a great plan to me. Cool. Now, one last mention of animal protein before we move on. My reading into paleo kept mentioning organ meats. Uh, These are things like liver, kidneys, and heart. 
I think most people under 60 in the U.S. haven't even tried organ meats, much less making them a regular part of their diet. What's the rationale for eating organ meats, and are there any reasons to avoid organ meats? Organ meats, when compared to the muscle meats you're probably used to eating, have a much greater concentration of, well, almost every nutrient you can think of. B12, iron, folic acid. Liver, for example, has one of the highest concentrations of vitamin A of any food. For quite some time, there has been the misapprehension that organ meats store toxins. For example, because the liver filters toxic chemicals from the blood, it was believed that eating liver could potentially dump some of those toxins into the bloodstream of the person eating the liver. Possibly the most legitimate reason to avoid eating organ meats is that they often contain high concentrations of purine, a substance that can cause symptoms to flare in patients who experience gout. And to forestall your next question, Gout is a form of inflammatory arthritis. Okay, next up is 15% each of fruits, vegetables, and nuts. And with the meat and or seafood, that would bring you up to your 100% of your daily food. Let's take a look at fruits and vegetables as their own thing for just a moment. At 30% of the daily intake, depending on which veggies you choose, one problem I can foresee is too many carbs. According to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, we should all be eating an average of 275 grams of carbs per day. And you can easily surpass this with fruits and veggies, especially, and I think I forgot to mention this sooner, potatoes are not allowed on a paleo diet. Um, now, are there any scientific concerns when it comes to fruits and vegetables beyond excess carbs? I mean, can you get too much fiber? Excess sugar and carb intake is certainly the most prominent concern when discussing how many fruits and vegetables to eat. Concerns about starch intake in general is likely why potatoes or any sort of tuber are not allowed on the paleo diet. And it is possible to intake too much fiber. Often someone suffering from excess fiber ingestion would suffer from symptoms like gas and bloating, abdominal discomfort, and constipation. Too much fiber in your diet can even lead, eventually, to an intestinal blockage or malabsorption of nutrients. The good news is that it's difficult for most people to eat enough fruits and vegetables to reach a point where they've created an excess. Fiber plays an active role in creating that sensation of fullness after you've eaten something. So by the time there's a risk of danger, you'd feel quite unexcited to keep eating more vegetables. I think we've reached the least exciting food group. In the paleo plan, nuts should make up 15% of your diet. And these are nuts like almonds, macadamia nuts, pistachios, walnuts, and more. This one is surprisingly tricky. I guess it's true of all food types when you look closely enough, but a lot of whether you should or shouldn't make nuts 15% of your diet have a lot to do with how they're processed. Can you break that down for us? I can certainly try. You, a potential consumer, walk into your local supermarket, having decided to buy a bag of mixed nuts to have it work as a healthier snack alternative. You walk down the snack aisle, then pick up a bag of roasted, salted mixed nuts, satisfied with a job well done. There's a few problems, though, and almost no one knows about them. Number one, in order to make those roasted nuts especially crispy and delicious, the manufacturer has coated those nuts in oil, and it's usually a mono or polyunsaturated oil, which we've already mentioned isn't great for you. And he's done that just before roasting. During the roasting process, an incredibly high heat is often used, which can cause the oils both on and in the nut to go slightly rancid. I can hear you crying out already. Brandon, I changed my mind in the store. I didn't get roasted nuts. I got raw, unsalted. That makes it okay, right? Unfortunately, many raw nuts have the phytoestrogens, the estrogen mimics I mentioned when we talked a little bit about soy, and all the attending issues that come along with them. Having said all that, I still advocate nuts as a useful and viable addition to a person's eating routine. I suggest purchasing raw nuts, soaking them in water overnight, then draining them and baking them in the oven at a very low temperature over a long period of time. The soaking process reduces the phytoestrogen content of the nut, while the slow and low roasting process keeps the oils in the nut from going rancid. You end up with a crunchy, tasty snack that you can flavor yourself with just a handful of spices. No one's going to do that, you know that, right? Maybe, you don't know. Buy a nut, plant it. Wait 42 years, then. Okay, let's say we have a hypothetical person who is 
hypothetically ready to build a huge shrine to Paleo in his house. Let's say this hypothetical person is seriously considering changing to a Paleo diet. What concerns with you as their hypothetical friend, godparent, and medical advisor would have for me, uh, them? My first thought is that most of the people who have found success and better health via the paleo diet have been reasonably healthy individuals, and younger than age 60. You, for example, seem to fit those descriptions pretty well. My next word of warning is about your kidneys. You'll be eating a fair amount of protein, which your kidneys are responsible for processing. Eat too much, and you might start seeing some dysfunction. So I would suggest you make sure to check with your physicians and get a lab workup to ensure that you can keep an eye on things. That's all my suggestions as a physician. As a friend, I can't help but notice you haven't mentioned one food item that I know is near and dear to your heart, and mine, coffee. Coffee is firmly in the no list if you were to go paleo. How does that impact your plans? Hmm. Yeah, I did notice that. While I do drink a lot of coffee, I've never actually liked the taste. So as long as I can get my caffeine from some source, such as tea, which is allowed on the paleo diet, uh, or caffeine pills, I'll be just fine. I have to warn you again about your excessive intake of caffeine, especially if you're taking it in the form of those capsules. Excessive caffeine intake has a number of harmful side effects, especially if used in excess over a period of years. All right, it's time to come clean. While I find the paleo diet interesting, there are a lot of things to consider before jumping on board. My examples from earlier, woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, I mention them to illustrate just how much our food options have changed. It truly is a different world now. Our bodies are different now. now there was a time, very recently in our biological history, when adult humans could not benefit from dairy products. But if your body has the necessary dairy enzymes, the addition of this great source of calcium and vitamin D to our diets is a big leap in human nutritional options. And there's a lot of food intolerances to consider, but if you're not sensitive to peanuts, they could be a good source of protein and vitamins. It seems to me that every type of food should be eaten in moderation with an awareness of its impacts on your body. Brandon, is there anything else you want to mention before we wrap it up? I find myself in agreement with your closing statement for today. Humans have changed. Even over the relatively small 10,000 year span since the invention of agriculture, evolution has begun to take effect. Enough that sticking rigidly to a diet because it matches the way our ancestors used to eat doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I've mentioned this in previous episodes, and I'm sure I'll mention it again in the future. I don't like the idea of dieting. There's no question that changing what they eat can make a huge difference in someone's health and well-being. The idea of dieting, however, implies a series of sudden and intense modifications, driven not by a desire to make lasting, thoughtful change in a lifestyle, but by a need for immediate results. Seeing a friend lose 20 pounds seemingly without effort by eating steak three times a day could seem appealing to some people. But it isn't a spectacular reason to make such a severe change all at once. The Paleolithic diet does have potential to be good for the right people. Even though the studies are small, making changes, even short term, to a few eating habits stands to help people find new ways to do things like moderate cholesterol levels and improve their liver health. The secret, though, is to take the elements of a paleo diet that you can implement them slowly, over time, in a way that's sustainable, and to avoid the rigid, blind following that a diet often follows. Maybe eating more fruits and vegetables than is generally suggested works best for you, or maybe your body just doesn't process all that extra protein very well. By making slight allowances and adjustments to match your own personal needs, I suspect you'll find better health without the fear of cheating on your diet. That's all the time we have for today. These short episodes are a brief overview of very complex topics. Everything we say is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Licensed healthcare professionals should advise you and be aware of changes you're planning to make to any aspect of your healthcare. Every person's needs are different. The links to references we've made about news articles, medical studies, or other materials can be found at level989.com 
along with our contact information and the complete Don't Take Medical Advice from Podcasts disclaimer. Thanks for listening, and now go health yourself. Thank you.